911, what's your emergency? 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the PIO Podcast, a place to discuss all public information related topics for police, fire, EMS, and local and federal government organizations. It was a good learning experience for a lot of us that, that social media is not real life. But we have to remember the media are very rarely a target audience. They're simply that conduit. Our words have impacts on individuals and it may not be positive. So just be just being thoughtful and mindful of the words that we speak. I think what's so interesting about this position too and this job and this profession is that um, every one of us is looking for purpose and when we find it here, that's it. To know is that a crisis for one is not necessarily a crisis for another. This episode is sponsored by the Social Media Strategy Summit, the leading provider of social media education. They host annual events designed specifically for government communications professionals like you to help you build and engage your communities through social media. Visit their website at socialmediastrategysummit.com to learn more and use promo code PIO podcast for 10% off of your registration. Afternoon today on the PIO podcast, we'd like to welcome Public Information Office Manager Erica Thomas from the Lincoln, Nebraska Police Department. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Robert. I appreciate it. Erica, so you transitioned to the PIO role, PIO role coming from the news media. Why the change? Yeah, so I actually spent about 20 years working in TV and radio as a journalist. I started at an NPR TV, uh, NPR radio station when I was in high school and then worked at TV stations in college. And then I worked full time as an anchor reporter producer at CBS stations in Iowa in Ohio and in Arkansas over the course of my career. And I spent the last decade of my career working as an evening anchor. And so that meant that I was going into work in the afternoon and not getting home until 11 o'clock or even midnight when I worked out on the East Coast. Uh, My husband and I have two young sons. And since the older one has started school, that has made the work-life balance a little bit more tricky. When I was working that former schedule, I would see my son 30 minutes a day. He would already be at school by the time I woke up. And by the time I got home at the end of my day, he would be in bed. And so we really made a decision that was best for our family to find something where I could have a schedule that was hopefully a bit more family friendly, but still allow me me to be passionate and, and find something that I wanted to do potentially outside of TV news. So once I started that job search process, it led me here. I didn't necessarily seek out a PIO role until I found this job posting, but it really just kind of um, all came together. And I really felt like it would be a good fit because I'd work closely with law enforcement in my role as a journalist. And so it still allows me to be part of the new cycle just in a different way. So were you stationed anywhere near Nebraska or the or the Lincoln area at the time? Sure. So my very first market in this was in Sioux City, Iowa. So it actually covered Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. So it covered very northeast Nebraska. That's actually where I met my husband, and he's born and raised a Husker fan. So when we were looking at opportunities, this put us about two hours away from his family. Okay. So that really was another part of that decision making that, for us. That makes sense. All right. Yeah. So for our listeners that don't know anything about Lincoln, Nebraska. What What's the city's population? How many sworn, how many civilian employees do you have? Sure. So Lincoln is the capital of Nebraska. We are approaching about 300,000 citizens in population here in the city. We also are home to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, so that brings in about 24,000 additional students. And then here at LPD, we have 334 sworn officers and 149 professional staff. So that total is 483, if I did my math correctly. And our authorized strength actually just got raised up this year to 371. So we are hiring as most police departments are. So join LPD.com. If I can plug our website, we are always looking for good officers. All right. Excellent. That's uh, a great thing. You know, everybody's looking for officers right now. That's a sad thing. (laughs) All right. So since you're relatively new, you told me you were only in the role for like the last six months. What are some of the things about the position that really surprised you? 
Sure. So I knew coming into this role that there was going to be so much I didn't know. And really, I feel like my years of experience working in a newsroom allowed me to have the maturity to understand that. I think in my early 20s, I probably would have come come in, you know, guns a blazing, no pun intended, saying, oh, we're going to make all these sweeping changes. But with more years of experience under my belt, I was able to walk in the door and say, you know, I know that there is so much here that I don't know. And it's really one thing to observe how a police department functions when you're a member of the public or a member of the media, but it's very different being on the inside and mm-hmm. learning all the processes. And so I feel like I've quickly come to learn that the role of the public information office is as much internal as it is external. So we're not just putting information out to the public, right? But we're also building relationships with all of those stakeholders, whether they're in the department, within the city, within the community. And so it really is a combination of communications, of marketing, public relations, recruiting. I didn't know I'd be doing recruiting until I was here. And so really everything and every day is different. And that part was not a surprise. It was just a matter of all the different things that I would get to do along the way. Okay, so when you first got in the position, uh, what challenges did you were you faced with? Yeah, I think it was just kind of understanding what the role looked like and what was going to be part of the day to day, right? I mean, I think you can have that thirty thousand foot view from the outside looking in, but it was understanding the nuances and what you know an hour by hour day might look like and how it would be very different from one day to the next, and just being kind of hands on and and having a lot of um, opportunities to kind of touch a lot of different parts of the department. So did you do any kind of like um, a 30, 60, 90 day plan or anything like that or a SWOT analysis of the position to kind of give yourself a direction? Um, I didn't write down anything specifically, but one of the things that I did do leading up to accepting the position and throughout the hiring process was really communicate and get to know other PIOs across the industry and talk with them about uh, pros and cons, what's worked for them. And so there were things that I came to the table with that I was interested in, you know, trying once I came in the door, but it was also about seeing how things were done here, right? Because every single department functions you know, similarly, but also has a lot of differences. And so I wanted to make sure to respect how they have been doing it and the whys behind that before making, you know, a lot of changes. And so I think we have a good mix now of of ways we're moving forward, but also things that have worked really well for the department. And this is something I think you told me in in, when we were going back and forth on LinkedIn, this is a new new civilian position, correct? For yeah. for Lincoln, correct. So before mm-hmm. they probably had a sworn personnel member in there, correct. And and they, why did they do that change? They wanted to make it more. Uh, they, they wanted a different perspective on it, or were they looking to move personnel around? Sure. No. So, I mean, I think it comes from a number of places. One, I think bringing in that outside perspective, bringing in someone with that media expertise and having the understanding of what our media partners are looking for, what they need, how their days function so that we can be the best partners possible with media and work together. But then also because we're short staffed, being able to have as many officers available to be on the streets and in other positions as possible. Uh, This was a position that could be made civilian and hopefully um, elevate the position or at least emulate what it had done before. I'm never going to be a cop, but I can bring in that social media and the media expertise to this role. So was the person in the position before, were they doing other duties besides the public information Role? You know, I, I don't know. It has definitely shifted some. And that person left the role, I think, in early 2022. So the position was open for quite some time in between. I know they did a number of different hiring rounds um, before um, the round that I applied for. And so I think it has definitely shifted some just in how the department looks now versus the personnel that was here before. Yeah, I know in many departments, especially those moderate sized departments, if they had a sworn member in there, they were doing multiple duties. And sure. The PIO role was kind of ancillary in a sense. Right. And, and they I, had the, the capabilities of doing so, right, as, as right. a sworn officer, for sure. Right, right. All right, yeah. so you have been in there for a little while. What would you do differently in your office now that you're in the position 
for six months. Sure. So I know that obviously we had you had uh, sent that question over to me, and I, and I was thinking about that. For me, I feel like it is really still a work in progress because you know I wanted to come in here with this open mind to learn and grow grow while I brought in my outside expertise. And one of the things that I think is important to note is that. I am not a one person department, even though I'm the only person with public information in my title. It really is kind of a team sport. So there are other officers that I do work with who have taken on some of the PIO responsibilities and duties. So we really all kind of chip in with that. I work closely with a captain and a sergeant who kind of had been that um, in between, between the last PIO and myself. They have continued um, in part of their role of doing public information and liaison with the media. And then we also have duty commanders. So we have some captains and lieutenants who step up and are our duty commanders. So on nights and weekends, they're the first person that media will contact. And then, of course, um, if there is a significant situation going on, they'll go out to a scene on a night or a weekend. And then I also will then prep people for media interviews. So because I have that background, I can get them ready. But I want to put my subject matter experts in front of the camera. While I have many years in front of the camera, I don't have the knowledge and expertise like they do for being a police officer for 15, 20, 25 years. So if I can get them comfortable with answering questions from the media, they can share their expertise in a way that highlights what the department is doing. And so I think that was important for me. I think at first when I came in, I thought I would be the one in front of the camera much more often, but that has not been the case. And I'm absolutely okay with that because I want the people who know what they're doing for the law enforcement side of things, speaking publicly with the background that I can give them and the support I can give them so that they feel comfortable in front of the camera. And then one thing that you may have noticed if you've done any research at all on LPD in recent months is that we have had a big change of leadership in the last uh, t- six months that I've been here. About two months ago, my former chief resigned. And so that is a big change that can happen. And for someone who's new on the job, having to make those adjustments and working now with our acting chief. And so I think that was important for me to be able to assess the impact that that would have on the PIO office. And so I did not want to rush into any big changes. You were asking, you know, what would I do differently? I think it's appropriate that we kind of take this thoughtful and slow approach to make sure that we're doing what's right for us, but also what's right for the media that we interact with and we have this responsibility toward every single day. And our acting chief is absolutely supportive of that. So we're making tweaks and changes along the way, but it's not like an overnight uh, massive change. One thing we did change a couple of months ago and has gotten good feedback, though, is we currently do a a three-day-a-week media briefing. When I arrived back in March of 2023, we were doing daily media briefings. And in my conversations with a lot of those different PIOs that I mentioned, many told me that in departments even much, much larger than ours here, they don't brief the media every single day. In fact, they rarely brief the media um, in a face-to-face setting. And so that's something that I think we have found kind of a a happy medium in being able to have those face-to-face interactions and build those relationships. That makes a big difference when you go out to the scene and you're seeing someone that you see three, four, or five times a week, um, but also making sure that it um, balances with our other roles and responsibilities in-house. So on days we have command staff, for example, it's helpful to not have a media briefing as well to kind of compete with that that time. On top of that, if you're doing any kind of internal communications, you're doing internal messaging for Mm -hmm. new orders or anything like that, it makes it difficult for you to do that if you've got to go out and do a media briefing. And I'm sure you have some kind of system currently where, where your incidents go out to the media anyways. You know, the general incidents, maybe the the bigger cases that have happened throughout the the overnight. And most of the media knows to look for those. They pick out the ones they want. And then they call you on those individual cases as opposed to going through a full media brief. Let's take a quick break. I think it would be useful at least to experiment. And I know some universities have started to experiment with this, but experiment with having, you know, a required course maybe for all students entering the university. Uh, They used to have a, a course at my university, which was like a, here's how to go to college uh, class, you know, here's how to study and things like that. They don't have that course anymore, but instead of having something like that, have a course that, you know, shows students, here's the history of free speech, here's how it 
Sure. So we do have, obviously, on our, our public homepage, we have a lot of information there. But the media does need to reach out to us if they want any details beyond just the very basic incident report um, information about date, time, location, that sort of thing. We do not include a narrative on those incident reports posted online. So that is part of the communication that they have with our department. And then we also will write up summaries for them where they can have a case summary so that they're not getting an entire case file. We're able to vet that information that's going out, but we can write them a summary. And we are actually working on a process right now of also including those summaries on our public homepage in the future. Yeah, that's something at my old department that, that we had where it was a system that was online. Uh, our supervisors, most of the, the street sergeants and sometimes lieutenants, the shift lieutenants would put together whatever the, whatever general information, date, time, location, what occurred, if there was an arrest or not. And that that was publicly available within an hour after an incident. Wow. This way, you know, the nice thing is, is the media got most of everything they needed. And if mm -hmm. they just needed to follow up, they would just call the next day. Sure. Well, that sounds like a great system. And, you know, here, obviously, I think we're working with a, a few less people, but figuring out how to make that work at various sizes of departments, I right. think is a challenge, but something that each department has to figure out what works for them and for their community, right? Yeah. When I was in my very first department, I used to put out a weekly or a daily uh, log of calls for service that we had. And that was so time consuming the first sure. hour and a half of the of the day, typing, yeah. you know, reading, summarizing, and putting out date, time, location. And the general narrative of the incident was mm -hmm. ridiculously too much work. Sure. Yeah, we are very lucky here. We do have some of that automated. So there's not a summary, but there's maybe like a half sentence, three or four words that kind of says what the call is about. And then some of those basic details. So at least the media can call and say, hey, I have a case number for you. Can you look it up and tell me if this is something of significance or is it is it a nothing burger? So what social media platforms are you currently using? Sure. So we uh, follow our city social media policy. I manage our Facebook page and our Twitter slash X, X. Yeah. I still call it Twitter, <laughs> our Twitter page. And then the city does have an Instagram account, but that is managed by the city and they post about all the departments. So my responsibilities are Facebook and Twitter. And really social media was a big part of what I did as my role as an evening anchor, being able to kind of build that online community and get a chance to interact with the public. So coming here, that was something that I really enjoy doing. And for me, it's a great way to use both kind of the analytical and the creative sides of my brain and kind of put that together. Mm -hmm. And so our goal right now in terms of how much we post, I try to post once a day, but our average is beyond that for if you look at any kind of given week as a snapshot and I have all that reported. And then because it's just me posting that social media content, I do plan ahead. So that way I know I have content coming up. That way, if I'm going to a training, for instance, I just went to an FBI leader training a couple of weeks ago and I was gone for a whole week. That content could automatically post. I didn't have to rely on colleagues to take care of that. And I knew there would be stuff getting out there. Of course, we have to make adjustments sometimes if there's you know something breaking or a situation happening here. And then um, for me, it's also about balancing because I'm a one man show when it comes to doing the social content if the juice is worth the squeeze, so to speak, because I'll work on video projects because of my background in TV. But a video project, as you may know, takes a lot more hours. Um, but ultimately, it still turns into one social media post. So, you know, I can't do a five hour project for every single social media post we put out there. Sometimes it has to be that half hour. Here's some, you know, quick information that's important for people to know, quick graphic or photo and make it you know, that a short time commitment so that I can put more hours into those other projects. And so it's a nice ba balance of like video content, photos, um, doing some of those graphics sometimes that we do in Canva. And so I try to balance that out across both Facebook and Twitter. So are you using Nextdoor at all? So we did at one point, but I think we are, we're not currently posting on Nextdoor. That has kind of come and gone over the years. But at this point, um, based on the social media policy that we follow, we're not posting on Nextdoor. Okay. And do you have any plans to add anything else? And not at this point, because we're following uh, the city's guidelines, you know, that social media policy would have to be updated to allow for other platforms to be added. I know at the city communications level, they were um, kind of exploring threads when that first launched. Um, but because, 
you know, I, I don't know what the decision has been on that, but what I've heard, you know, colloquially is that threats hasn't uh, done as much as people thought it might, and it's kind of petered out a bit. It, so it, I don't know if that's something they'll continue doing. Yeah, it kicked off with a lot of excitement because people are looking for an alternative, but. Right. Really, unless you're somebody famous, you're really not getting anything out of it. I've been on there for sure. a while and and not really seen anything of any nope other than beyond famous people on there. So, Gotcha. Yeah. And that's kind of the feedback I've heard as well. So I'll be curious to see what they decide at the city level for that. But we do not have a department threads and, as it stands. And no YouTube channel. So there is an old YouTube channel that I think was used for recruitment at one point in the past. Um, but right now, YouTube content goes up through our city as well. So if we have content, video content that the city would also like to share, it gets posted on the city's YouTube channel. Okay. So you, I know you said you just recently completed an FBI lady course. That was a media and public relations course, right? Correct. So yes. What were the three takeaways that you took from that course? Because sure. Because a so lot of... Hold on real quick. I just yeah. want to say a lot of people have not had the chance to take an FBI LIDA media relations or master PIO class. I suggest every PIO that's listening, if you haven't gone, go to them. They're great courses. They've got great instructors. It's an excellent program for a PIO. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I'm so grateful that I got to do it within my first six months because I think it really is able to help me kind of set the stage moving forward. If I had been in this role a year or two and then done that course, I think it would have been a very different experience. And so for me, one of the, the biggest takeaways that I had right off the bat was the concept of the CAP principle. And if you're not familiar with that, it's for kind of crafting responses where you start with a care, concern, you include a handful of action items and then you talk about perspective for the future and it was really for me about having a home base to come back to for your answers so that way when the media is asking you questions about a situation you know you can respond to those and then circle back to your main messaging so i found that really helpful i also really enjoyed and learned a lot from our scenario run throughs we did a number of those and for me uh, the ability to practice in a safe space be able to ask questions interact with other pios who are also kind of learning uh, this process when you're not in the middle of a crisis, you know, it helps you become better. And then to me, I was really thankful about getting to meet all these different people. The FBI leader course I attended was actually only about 45 minutes from where we are here in Lincoln at a local department in Beatrice, Nebraska. That was not originally the, pro the plan to go there, but it was nice because we had a lot of uh, local and regional agencies, a number of different Nebraska agencies, Iowa agencies, ones that we may interact with if there's a, a you know, a regional crisis. And so to get to know people that are pretty close to home is really great as well. Now, I am hopefully planning on going to the Master PIO course in Boca Raton coming up in February. So I'm excited to go to Florida in February, but that will be meeting people that have, you know, a bigger kind of national scope as opposed to someone that's in my backyard. When you're down there, say hi to Mark Akon a movie see a PIO down there yeah I will I'm excited to meet him in person he and I have already communicated over email he sent me over some documents like crisis communications plans and those sorts of things and it's been really great to see how this network of PIOs across the country really is willing to help each other out and someone who's a newbie like me they're willing to just shoot me an email and say here you go oh yeah there are so many of those in the, in this field and willing to do things pass yeah. information on and listen, plagiarism is the highest form of flattery as a PIO. If you don't have to recreate it, all you have to do is change a header. Why right. not? Right? Yes. I mean, we're all government. We're all working together for the same cause. And so I think it's it's different in this industry than maybe in other industries where you feel like this direct competition with other people. Right. I've really felt a camaraderie across the board from other PIOs, whether it's here in Lincoln, regionally, or people that I've met at these conferences and trainings. Yeah. And, yeah, and you'll find out if you get a chance to go to one of the NAOA conferences, I suggest you go to that too, especially now that they're back in Nashville, because it just makes life much more fun. Yes, I'm, I'm hoping to do that too. Just the networking opportunities yeah. for going to the NAO is well worth it. So, Erica, are there, is there a question that I should have asked? And if so, how would you have answered it? So in thinking about that, I think for me, it would be kind of talking about the big professional shift that I recently made. So 
in making that one of the most crucial things that helped me prepare to make that decision to accept the position and then to navigate these last six months was really reaching out to those other law enforcement PIOs that I mentioned. So I actually started those conversations with people that had also been in TV news and made a similar shift as me and then reached out to others that they recommended and so kind of went down the line. So I probably talked to at least a dozen PIOs across the country prior to even accepting this position. And those conversations uh, really made a difference for me. I'm so grateful for the people that took time out of their day to talk to me, especially since, you know, every police department, sheriff's office is run slightly differently, but it gave me an idea of things that I could try, things I could expect. And actually, one of the ideas that came from one of those phone calls I implemented here, and it's been amazing to watch it, you know, come into action. One of the police PIOs I had talked about, talked with, had told me how she had implemented a social media portal through her website. I think she used Google Forms, but it was a way for anyone in her department to submit videos or photos, ideas they had for posts on social media. And then it all got filtered down to her. And I noticed when I started here as well that, you know, sometimes you get a text, sometimes you get a knock on the door, sometimes someone would stop you on your way to the bathroom, right? And so you may not always be in the right headspace or have a notebook with you to chat with them about their idea or what they want to post about. And so I actually worked with our web and IT team here to make a portal as well. And it's been very successful because people can go there. I was able to craft the questions that I need. So that way we don't have to text back and forth 10 times for me to figure out the who, what, when, where, those sorts of details. And it's been really helpful. And that came from one of those conversations conversations. And so whatever career shift you're planning on making, I think doing that research ahead of time and talking to people in the industry is really pivotal for understanding what you're getting into. And then in terms of the building relationships, um, that was something that I realized was really important to me. And so just recently, actually, about three weeks ago, I created a uh, private social media group on Facebook called Public Safety PIO Women. And in about two and a half weeks, we've already grown to 130 members. And it's really just a place for people to ask questions, interact with each other. There's women in there that have been in this industry for 20 years and then ones as new as me. And it just gives us a smaller place to kind of um, interact and confide and ask questions in a safe spot. And so I think that was just the biggest thing for me that's made me feel more comfortable in making this huge life change. <laughs> Outstanding. Yo, that's, that is a great idea. Um, getting information from your people internally makes your job so much easier because obviously yes. if everybody knows that there's a somewhere to send that information to quickly, exactly, it gets you in the format that you want and right. you're able to put it back out quicker and, and they feel empowered to give you more information later on. So it's a win-win all the way around. That's awesome job. I agree. Yeah. And it's just streamlined the process, which is always helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So we're going to go into some rapid fire questions. You ready? Okay. Yes. Texting or talking? Both. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Neither. <laughs> Adult drink of choice? A mojito. Nice. What would be your superpower if you could have one? Uh, teleportation, because I hate traffic. <laughs> Ask permission or beg for forgiveness? I want to be the beggar, but I am the asked permission person. <laughs> It becomes a PIO way to eventually ask for forgiveness. Right. Yeah. If you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would you choose? So I don't drink coffee, but I would love to have dinner with Neil Armstrong because I've just been fascinated by space my whole life. And, and I would love to, to talk with him about, about going would to Would you like to ask him if he actually was on the moon? <laughs> I do not think there is a conspiracy behind that. So I, I believe him, every but time I, I, can you find know, out more. I see that stuff. <laughs> My grandfather worked with the space program and he, oh, he really? yeah, he was an engineer on, on almost all the Apollo missions. Wow. Um, I can't imagine that it was fake and he didn't know about it. So, right. But yeah, there's all kinds of people that believe it. It would be something if it was <laughs> fake. <laughs> so what key points would you like the listeners to take from today's interview? Yeah, so I feel like, and, and maybe this is more for me selfishly, but really that, you know, change, especially like I have gone through in the last year can be really scary, but can also be very rewarding. I have really learned so much and grown so much, both personally and professionally in the last year of my life. And I think that came from not only the job search process, which can be very daunting, especially these days, to then moving my family hundreds of miles away to a city we've never lived in or starting a new career 
year after I had been, you know, living my dream job for decades. And so, um, yeah, it's, you know, change can be really scary, but it's also really rewarding. And watching what my colleagues do here at LPD every day, I'm just in awe of them. You know, people have asked me before, mistaken me for a police officer. They'll call me, you know, you're a public information officer. That means you're, you're police, right? I said, I could never do what they do. It is incredible what they do. And they do it with so much compassion and heart. And so I'm just really honored to be able to highlight and showcase the work that they do. Yeah, and that most people don't realize that that our job is is not to talk about ourselves. Our job is to no. highlight the agency and the people there, and to, and yeah. to promote what they're doing on a daily basis with without bias. That's our job, and we're mirrors of our department. That's what we we're supposed to be doing. That's a great way to describe that. Yeah. Absolutely, and that goes back to a, a, a reporter, a journalist here in Chicago, and his name is Ben Bradley. He uh. He, my daughter met him because she's going, she was going to journalism. And I said, Ben, what's a good way to describe a journalist? And he says, well, we're mirrors of society. That's our job mm-hmm. is to mirror society. So that's the way I always came in as I, as I went to become a PIO was to be that for the agency. Yeah. I love that. And it's also a great opportunity to still be a storyteller, right? Like that is what I am in my soul. And that doesn't change in this role. Outstanding. So, Erica, how can people best reach out to you if they want to connect or follow up on anything they heard here or, or recruit? Yes, absolutely. So um, for me personally, if they're trying to connect with me directly, I do have a public Facebook page um, from my time as a journalist that I have continued even in this role. So if they search Erica Thomas on Facebook, they'll come across that. I'm also on LinkedIn, which is where you and I connected. And then I manage the LPD Facebook and Twitter pages. So if they were to reach out there, I'm the one that's messaging them back. Um, they can also email or call me and I can give you that information to put in the show notes. But it's it's not hard to find me. And I, will, I will add all that stuff in of the show notes so that it won't be a problem Perfect. for people to connect with you. Erica, yeah. thank you very much for coming on this show. I truly appreciate it. And I know it, it was, it was quick, quick. All of a sudden we are, we're done and we're ready to go. So I really appreciate you jumping on this quickly. Absolutely. I appreciate your time and being willing to talk with someone like me who is so new to this industry. And if I could just make one final plug, I think it's really important for, you know, someone in my position and someone who's been doing this for 20 years to really take their mental health into account and uh, prioritize that because this role, just like what I used to do in news, sees a lot of things and hears a lot of hard things. And so we need to be able to care for ourselves before we can be the best PIO, we can be for me being a wife and a mother are so important. And I can't do that if I don't take care of myself and mental health is at the top of that list. So I would urge everyone to seek therapy and, uh, you know, fight the stigmas that exist around mental health, because I think all of us could use that support. Absolutely. And I, and I actually wrote a blog article in life for the PIO. So if you go back through my LinkedIn, there's a blog article that specifically talks about self-care as public information officer. So very important for us to do that. Um, yeah. You know, it, sometimes you don't realize it creeps in and can really wreck your life. So it's important to take care of yourself. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Robert, for your time. I'm so grateful and I enjoy. I'm excited to subscribe to the podcast and listen to more episodes. I'm glad you joined. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notified of the latest episode. If you are listening on a platform that allows reviews, please give us a review. We appreciate any review, good or bad. It helps us improve on each episode. Until next time, be safe.